quite a bit in. Okay, and we're going to go into lots of fun things. So, the 1960s, the counterculture movement changed in America. This is kind of right down my alley because I was not quite involved, but I was a young child could understand it enough to get it. Our first subtopic is going to be the now generation. Okay, now generation. Now, uh, what does a counterculture mean? Of the kind of opposite of what people are used to morally and and you know what you're supposed to be doing and that type of thing well let's talk about classes we have the lower class we've got the middle class we've got the upper class well then we got the lower middle class and we kind of have the upper middle class too what type of youth in the 1960s do you think made up this counterculture movement that went against the north was it the lower class middle class upper, upper class upper, upper middle, middle. Upper okay middle. okay let's start the how many think it was the upper class now, only vote once how many think it was the upper class kids that were rebellious so to speak how many think it was the middle of like upper upper middle? Middle? Yeah. yeah that would be upper middle yeah between the middle okay how many think it was the middle class kids that revolted Okay, how many think it was the lower middle, and how many think it was the lower class? Then? Now this is really interesting because all the years I've been teaching this, 90% of the kids pick the lower class people as the ones that did this. It actually was the upper middle class. Do I have that somewhere that you know? Did <laughs> <laughs> so I say before, it? Before you came in, oh, you said you're like, you said you're like, 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 you're yeah, well, there we go. <laughs> you, ruined, you ruined the whole thing because I, they, everybody always says lower. All right, well, anyway, now that you know, let's have a quiz. All right, take a How far did she get? Well, anyway, the counterculture movement in America was made up of the upper middle class youth. Now, this upper middle class youth became known in the counterculture movement as the now generation. That's what they call themselves, the now generation. So what the now generation is, it is the upper, it's upper middle class youth who went against the grain and made up what we know as the counterculture movement. Now, this might be kind of interesting. The biggest defiance between youth of American adult authority was the public defiance, absolutely doing the opposite. So the biggest symbol of the counterculture movement was the public defiance between the youth of America and adult authority, okay? Now, there was kind of two examples. I can remember this when I was in seventh grade in 1972 because we had the end tail of this thing, so to speak. But anyway, what did a male do to show his defiance to authority in the 1960s? No. What? What did males do? I remember my dad thought it was the most horrible thing in the world, and even throughout my career, he made he sure didn't I didn't say, do this. No? no. Okay, appearance. They just didn't look at me. No. Long hair. Long hair. Long. The biggest symbol of defiance in males during the 1960s was to grow your hair long. That was really not what things used to be. Everybody was kind of high and tight. It's kind of funny because we metamorphosized kind of back into that. You don't see a lot of males with real long hair. Boy, if you that's what you did to defy your parents in the 1960s. You grew your hair really long. That was really unusual. And I remember, and we'll talk about, the, well, I'll wait, and we'll talk about this. Now, how about women? What did girls do to show their defiance appearance-wise? No, did they have any very good. Wore very, very short dresses. Now, because of this defiance of long hair and short dresses, this is for the first time in history where dress codes came into being in public schools. Okay? All of a sudden, in the 1960s and 70s, and I can remember this like it was yesterday when I was in junior high in 1972, dress codes were implemented for the first time. And I can remember a couple stories. Roger Birdall, I'll never forget this. I mean, I, this is 1972. You know, I'm like 12 or 13. And the first day I walk into Forsyth Middle and High School, it was called Junior High and High School in those days. When I first walked in there from the sixth grade, I noticed two things right off the bat. I noticed Roger Birdall being kicked out of school by Principal Goyette because his hair was over his ears. I'm not making that up because the rule was no and, the, and he had sideburns. 
and he kicked him out of school. And Roger, in protest of that, I'll never forget this, stupid as it sounds, that entire three days he was suspended, he drove his motorcycle up and down Main Street in <laughs> protest of that. I'm not kidding you. It was like a really big deal. It seems stupid now, but it was a really big deal. And Roger Burdall got kicked out of school because he wouldn't cut his hair. It was over his ears. Now, this is, yeah. I was, well, let's see, I graduated in 76, so I was 71, so I was 17 minus 5, 12 or 13. Oh, you remember those names? Oh, I can remember. You would remember Brian's things. Brian's hair would be okay? Brian would be okay. Everybody in here would be pretty good because, I mean, you things have changed. To me. No, everybody would be pretty good. Yeah. Now, all the guys are here. another thing I'll know. never forget that day was Lenore Larson. This, I'm not making this up. This girl was a really attractive, blonde, skinny girl. And I mean, her dress was like, whoa. And I walked in and I said, welcome to the high school, baby. I mean, it was unbelievable. And I remember Ed Goyette escorting her out the front door and about three of her friends, Marcia Dean, you can remember Marcia Dean is, and, and uh, Oh, God, what was the other gal's name? I'd have to think of them. Uh, but anyway, they had to go home and got suspended because their dresses were short. And I'm going to tell you, kiddos, they were short. I'm just telling you. Anyway, I can remember that. And that was kind of the defiance that started the now generation and the counterculture as kids start doing things that were not seen as normal. Yep. Do you think that the dress code should still be used? Well, we can get into that discussion. I think that I think that we get a little crazy on stuff. I don't particularly like seeing everybody's body parts in school, to be honest with you. But I mean, I think you know, caps in school is an old-fashioned tradition. I mean, there's lots of things. I think I think we're in pretty good shape. I think this, but this with these days, I mean, if you came to school like lots of kids come to school here, you'd have got sent home without question. I mean, it just wasn't. It was a whole different world. So the point of this is I'm going to give you seven beliefs that the now generation had that really went against the grain of what the values were at that time. These were like, whoa, you know, this is crazy. And it might not seem crazy to you, but at that time it was incredibly crazy. So I'm going to give you seven beliefs that the now generation had that went against the grain of American values. First of all, these people wouldn't have liked this class much because students that were belonged to the now generation believed that the past was useless, not worth notice or study. So they weren't interested in history of any kind. These people believed that the past was useless, useless and not worth notice or study. So a history class would not have been something that this now generation of Americans would have been interested in. Number two, they became interested in these types of subjects instead. <coughs> Mythology, astrology, and religion. They became more interested in things like mythology, astrology, and religion. And you might look at that and say, well, God, that seems kind of interesting. Mythology, astrology, and religion, pretty important. But back in the 1960s, what was important? Reading, writing, and arithmetic, the four cores, math, science, English, social studies, that's what was concentrated on in high schools. I had a discussion just the other day with a student in the guidance office who said to me, gee, Mr. Gerber, did you work really hard? Did you get good grades in high school? Did you have all these pressures on that I feel? And I told her no. I said, when I went to high school in 1976, all you had to do was, I mean, you had four years of English, three years of math, three years of science, three years of social studies, and who cares? It was just not even close. And ACT scores didn't mean anything. You know, we stuck, we were we were the four cores. That's what we did. But it was a different game. Okay. The third example of their beliefs is they really lost interest in the four cores: math, science, social studies, language arts. They lost interest in the four core subjects. They were much more interested in other things. So they didn't have any interest in science or math or social studies or language arts. They lost interest in the cores. The fourth belief of the now generation that went against the grain of American values at the time is they had a very anti-scientific attitude. Very anti-scientific attitude. And along with that, number five, 
they had a very strong rejection towards leadership. Being a leader in the 1960s was not popular. They had a very strong rejection against leadership. Whether that be the student council president, or the governor, or a senator, or the president, or military leaders, or whatever. They did not like leadership. Yep. So basically they were all just anarchists in training? Kind of, yeah, kind of, yeah. Another trait or belief of the now generation that went against the grain of American values is they were concerned about pollution and the environment. Nobody was really that concerned about pollution and the environment in the 1960s, frankly. And they became concerned of that. Now, I know this all seems a little odd to you, but it was, you know, we've had a transition of, of how we believe, you know what I mean? So there was a huge concern about pollution and the environment on part of those particular young Americans. And the seventh belief of the now generation, they believed in a no growth economy. And it probably doesn't mean what you think it means. What would you think they would be against? They were they were they were for, they believed in a no growth economy. What would you think that would have to do? What's that? No? No growth economy. You didn't the economy is stale? It didn't have anything to do with the economy, to be honest with you. No growth economy. They believed in stabilizing the population in the United States. We were getting too overpopulated. They even wore buttons around that said what? Stop at two. In other words, their belief was to have two children and that is it. Stop at two. So they, had a, they believed in no growth economy. They believed that the population of this country was getting to be too high, that we need to stabilize the population, and they even wore buttons around that said stop at two. So your, so your LDS and your Catholics would have been out of luck in the 60s, so to speak, right? That doesn't mean that, doesn't mean that that happened, but that was their belief, that the population was getting out of control and we needed to limit it to two children. That was their belief. Now, this is going to get a little dicey. This is going to get a little dicey, but I want you to pay attention. And I, 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 things worked out good for me today. I was a little nervous about this, but here we go. The now generation also contributed to what we know as the sexual revolution in America. And I'm just, I'm not going to get crazy, but I'm going to tell you the differences between the 60s. Prior to the 60s, we were pretty conservative as far as sexuality went, and the talk about sex, and the talk about this and that. Didn't, it was kind of taboo. You didn't talk much about that. You know, wasn't anything. You didn't see it on, well, they, you know, TV was different, but that, it just was way different. Well, the now generation really contributed with the, to the beginning of the sexual revolution. I'll give you some examples of what we've transformed from, okay? Now, attitudes towards a person's sexuality became more open during the 1960s. People talked more about sexuality. They talked more about things. And it's kind of led to how loose we are, so to speak, today in our thought process on sexuality and sex. Now, it's it's nothing now if you go to a movie and see somebody nude, fully nude in a movie now. I mean, you just think that's, I mean, it's rated, but it's not unusual, right? Well, it was in the 1960s where being nude and being seen nude became more acceptable. It wasn't at all acceptable prior to this. They would have sitcoms like, uh, I'm trying to think of uh, Archie Bunker, or you know where you watch TV today and the man and the wife are in the same bed sleeping in a, in a movie or whatever? Back in those days, I can remember the Dick Van Dyke show, which was a yeah, comedy, yeah. and they had separate bedrooms. It would have been taboo to put on TV that they, even, even a married couple would be in the same bed on TV. I mean, this I'm telling you, this was a huge change. Yeah. I don't think they, I don't, know. no, but the point is, you didn't, it wasn't as open as you see now. I mean, in the 60s, if we'd have had Facebook and seen some of the things that are posted on Facebook that have to do with sexuality, oh my God, I mean, but the 60s, this now generation became more open about being nude, more open about being seen nude, okay? And probably the best example is this, is nudity starts for the first time to be shown in the film industry, in movies. And it wasn't a big deal. Frontal nudity started coming out in movies. Frontal nudity. Okay? And that basically was, for lack of a better term, 
nude from the waist up on TV, male or female. Okay, not so much the other part. Okay, but I mean now it's not limited to that. It's crazy. But frontal nudity became a necessity in films. They were targeting teens and young adults because, hey, come and come to this film now. You can see frontal nudity, which was something they hadn't seen in the past. Was taboo. Now, what happened in the film industry because of this looser philosophy on sexuality? What happened for the first time in the film industry when these movies came out showing sketchy things in people's minds? They started to rate them. Very good. And this is where ratings came up in movies. And they weren't rated like they are today. I'll tell you how they were rated then. You can tell me maybe how they compare to today. The first rating, obviously, was G for general audiences, which is what we have today, right? We have G rating for general uh, audiences. Okay. The next rating was M for mature, which should probably be what now? PG-13. Exactly right. Then they had R for restricted, which is the same as what we have now that either shows a lot of violence or nudity or language. That's how you get an R-rated movie is nudity, violence, or language. And we don't show anything past that unless you go to the porno shop, right? I mean, you'd have to go to a special place to see anything other than that, right? But in those days, they actually rated films X. X-rated films were movies that were shown that were probably not as bad as an R-rated movie today, but was really sketchy in those days. So you could go watch a G-rated movie, an M-rated movie, an R-rated movie, and if you were over 21 years of age, you would go watch an X-rated movie. Okay, that's, what, that's kind of toned down. But again, in today's society, their X-rated movie probably be like an R-rated movie today. Is the X-rated movie the only one that had an H-limit? No, I think restricted, it was the same type of thing, you know, PG-13 was, I think they all were in that arena, but they just rated them different. But the amazing thing was that you could go watch an X-rated movie, but if you compare it, it'd probably be like an R-rated movie today. Now, this gets a little personal, but I'm just going to tell you. Because of the liberal philosophies of sexuality in the 1960s, many negative issues arose concerning these youth of America. And I'm going to give you some problems that began in the 1960s that I think that we probably take for granted today, okay? Now, you're, I don't even know what they call, I, they call it, it you have, you have, kids ever talk about VD anymore? You, ever, you know what VD is? No. Okay, that's the change. One thing that really became rampant in the 1960s because of the change in philosophy and sex was the catching of venereal disease known as VD. And basically what it was is if you have multiple partners, they get a disease and then you pass it on to everybody else. We, we, what's that? An STD, yeah. They called it for venereal disease in those days. So everybody that was doing sexual things went and got a shot so they wouldn't get VD. VD was a big deal in the 60s and 70s. That's something you didn't want to get because it wasn't good for your private parts in any gender. I mean, it was a bad thing, but it was pretty rampant in the 1960s because of this new attitude. So it really became a reality during the sexual revolution. It spread like wildfire, okay? And it was a telltale sign that you were active, and you call them STDs today, but these were like, you know, 70% of the population of the youth were having these things. I mean, it was very, very rampant. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, it, yeah, it, it just, but anyway, this all ties into the 60s. Another negative issue, and I'm not trying to offend anybody here, things worked out today, were unwed mothers, okay? That was, that was an unusual situation in the 1960s. I'm just telling you, it was an unusual situation. Unwed mothers, <laughs> prior to the 1960s, that was really taboo. Number of un unwed mothers rose by the thousands. Young men fathered children, more than one, with no responsibility. They had all this promiscuous activity, and a man would have seven children with you know, seven different women. And unwed mothers by the thousands. And men and women actually lived in communes together, where there might be 12 women and 12 men who not only shared experiences with each other, but everybody else in the commune. Yeah, and it resulted in venereal disease, 
and unwed mothers and irresponsible fathers. And I'm just going to tell you, and I'm not, I, I know it's different now, but this was a huge change in the 60s. And if you were pregnant and you went home and told your dad in high school that you were pregnant, your dad would disown you and kick you out of the house. That was very common practice. And I'm going to show you a very good uh, video series called The 1960s in which you'll see all of this and how it really was. So, Is this why child support Oh, well, we'll get to that in a minute, okay? But anyway, venereal disease, unwed mothers. Sexist attitudes in males came out at this point. And the male motto in the 1960 was, do your own thing, but let the women clean up the mess. You know, I don't care if I impregnate seven girls. That's their problem. I'm moving on to the next. They can clean up the mess. Males took, like, no responsibility in this team. It was awful. And women, there are a lot of families broken up, a lot of kids that were estranged from their parents because of this situation. It's more acceptable today. And I'm not, you know, I'm not being mean. I love her or death, but I'm glad she's not here because we're talking about this. But her situation's more accepted than if it was 1962. It would have been a whole different game, I can assure you. And that's what I'm talking about. This now generation has transformed philosophies that affect us even today. Because prior to the 1960s, this was not good. Now, here's another thing. Irresponsibility among young adults and improper parenting. I think that improper parity that we have today started right here in the 1960s, right? Because parents didn't take responsibility. They really did not. You know what the most important, you know, 60s was known as the drug culture. A lot of drugs were taken in the 60s. You know what historians think was the most important drug that actually saved America in the 1960s? The invention of what drug? What? No? How about birth control?